Welcome to the California Appellate Court Legacy Project. California's first constitution, adopted in 1850, established the judicial branch to protect the rights of the citizens of our great state and vested final judicial review in the Supreme Court. In 1905, the constitution was amended to establish the Courts of Appeal to provide intermediate review of trial court judgments and to ensure our laws are interpreted and applied consistently. The rich history of the Courts of Appeal and the individuals who served as justices is collected in the Legacy Project. Their personal stories showcase a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. They describe how their lives were shaped and how their service shaped the appellate courts throughout the years. The following excerpts provide a small sampling of the upbringing, education, careers, and judicial experiences of those who served as appellate justices. I played football and you know, varsity football. I was called the tennis shoe tackle because my family was so poor. Uh, they didn't think, my dad didn't think he could afford the cleats. So we had this deal. If I made the team, he would get me cleats. I was uh, born in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Irish Catholic family. It, it seems like it was another world. I became a registered nurse. And then I went in the <clears throat> Army Nurse Corps. I went to Vietnam uh, during the war. That Vietnam experience probably stamped me for a lot of what I do today. It's a uh, proud background, uh, not always an easy background. Uh, born and raised uh, in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and I do remember well the, the uh, eviction notices that were being posted in the mid-50s uh, for the Bunker Hill Redevelopment Project. Many times very difficult uh, growing up uh, economically. It is why I have always felt blessed to look back on my career and uh, track it and uh, see where I've been and uh, uh, where I am now. Dorsey High School, which I graduated from, my graduating class of 750 had 125 white kids. And it was the last class out of Dorsey with any significant number of whites. They had bailed out of the whole Crenshaw neighborhood. My education in going through public schools in the inner city, which moved from a pretty unsegregated grammar school to a very highly segregated uh, junior high school, and then back to a racially balanced high school, was something that was, I think, I think molded my own personality, my philosophy in life, and my ability to relate to others. I think it was a great experience. I would never have traded for anything. I hated law school, actually. I didn't like the way they taught. I didn't like the Socratic method, and it took a while to catch on with that. I wanted to go to Yale because somehow I had the idea that Yale was an unusually open, stimulating place. I think I made a good choice. For the most part, um, the attitude in the law school was totally different than the undergraduate school. Uh, they had a commitment to uh, diversity. They really didn't care much about your background. It was pretty much a meritocracy in terms of, you know, class participation, grading, and everything else. Allison was born December 8. I think I was in class the day before she was born. And so I was out until the next semester began and uh, went back to school and uh, had a newborn. My folks said, okay, what do you want? We'll pay for tuition or books, which one? And, and at the time, tuition was $356 a semester. So I picked tuition and my books were double that. I think back about the lack of planning in my life, I mean, I didn't even know a lawyer. I'd never met a lawyer. And I'm not exactly sure what I expected. With no DA experience at all, I applied and it was the strangest thing. It was almost as if the DA could not hire me fast enough. My round three interview goes, I'm meeting with the DA himself uh, and 
the next afternoon I get a call, can you start on Monday? Like it was so, I didn't even have an opportunity to really think about what it would be like <laughs> to be a prosecutor. And just like that, I was a prosecutor. I started a public interest law firm called Public Advocates, stopping urban renewal projects and federal aid highways that were displacing uh, people from uh, affordable housing. After law school, I got a clerkship with uh, the Chief Justice, Earl Warren. And the thing about him, he just had a common sense way of cutting through and putting his finger on what was, what was significant and what was important. I interviewed in Sacramento with the Attorney General's office and they wanted to hire me. And they said, we would like to make you a job offer. And I said, don't you want to ask me about my children? Mm -hmm. I was trying to anticipate the problems that everyone else had had. And they said, no, we think you're qualified and we would like to hire you. And I said, oh my gosh, I found my home. We were a small firm or sole practitioner for that time. And um, it was always feast or famine. And I can remember things like driving back from a deposition in Walnut Creek one day thinking, how am I going to make payroll this afternoon? And then finding a check in the mail from a client. There was a great deal of consternation in the community over this shooting. So there was a very preliminary investigation after which the officers were cleared. I became incensed as only a 20-something year old cat and said, somebody has to do something about this. And I said, I just passed the bar. And I thought maybe he'd be happy. And he said, really? He said, don't you feel bad? You took a job away from some man trying to support his family. And I looked at him and I said, are you crazy? There was rampant discrimination. There was also a lot of discrimination against women in the law. It mattered that we were shut out of places, that we were excluded that there, you know, our world, the legal world, was a uh, boys club. I thought the interview went pretty well. I answered the questions in a, I thought, a, a way that I did just fine. And at the end of the interview, he said, this is 1978. I know a lot of firms are doing it but we're, not, we're just not ready. We're just not ready to have a woman lawyer. I had a wonderful relationship with my colleagues and I, I don't want to suggest I had otherwise, but they were learning. They, they've never worked with a woman in that position ever. I got a job working for the uh, Caltrans legal division. And during the interview, one of the men turned to me and said, well, how are you going to choose between being a lawyer and being a, a uh, a wife. And I said, well, when you were interviewed, were you asked how you would choose between being a lawyer and a husband? And he said, no, I wasn't. I said, then I refuse to answer the question on the ground it's discriminatory. The client called uh, the partner I was working with, whose name was Stan Doten. And he said, you know, you've got this girl working on our case. I think she's a little too young. Can you find someone who's, who's, who's got a little more, you know, years on them? And Stan said back to him, we will decide how to staff our cases. If you don't like our decision on that, you're going to have to find another law firm. It was much harder to diversify the, the, the bench then than it is today. And the reason is, is there were so few women and people of color who were constitutionally eligible. You couldn't be a judge unless you have been a lawyer for 10 years. I think it's important for non-Muslims to see that, hey, we have Jewish judges, we have Christian judges, we have Buddhist judges, we have judges who do not practice any religion at all. We can also have Muslim judges and, and that's okay. Uh, and everything's going to be fine. It's important for the public to see that they will have a fair shake if they go into the courtroom and if they see people that look like them, I think they'll feel better about going into the courtroom. 
I was speaking to a, a community group, and uh, after I was done speaking, uh, a young parent brought their child up to me um, to introduce me to them and to take, take a picture with them and basically say, I, I want my child to know that you are, you know, they can accomplish what you've accomplished, that they don't need to be afraid, they don't need to feel like it's, it's not for them, that you are just like them. I think we have a better court today uh, now that we are a more diverse court. Every lawyer would like eventually to be a judge if they had a chance, but not everybody has a chance. I ran for the Superior Court um, and was elected. I got a very small margin of victory, but I won. And so there I was on my way. Campaigning is like living in another world. It was the hardest year of my life. I've never worked so hard. The hardest part is that you're just always, 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 always on. So there are many things about the community I had to learn. That's the good part of it. It was such an eye-opener for me. It was so exciting. I never dreamed of becoming a judge. Goodness sakes, who would do that? I, I thought, uh, I don't have any power. I have no political connection. I don't have any money. And one day, uh, one of my dearest friends, and he says, you know, you really ought to apply for the bench. I said, are you nuts? He goes, no. Our boss, former AG George Dugmajan, had just become governor, and he was making appointments, and he's looking for qualified people. And he said, you'd be great. I never thought of being a judge for a couple of reasons. I didn't know any politician. I didn't know the governor, number one. Uh, and that was just a very remote idea. But number two, with the last name Ramirez at the time, uh, that's the last thing I wanted, my, my sense of running a, a judicial campaign and the last name Ramirez, which uh, back then, it's hard to imagine that now, wasn't a name that, that uh, I thought might be accepted by the voters. I spent uh, almost three years in family law. I think it was a great, a great experience. And, and I'm sorry that so many judges treat family law as sort of a poor relation because it's so important to the people who are there. And particularly now when so many of the people in the court in family law are self-represented, they need uh, judges who care about the job. I very strongly believe that the judges should stay out of the trial. You don't want to put your finger on the scale. There was one trial that actually did this. I uh, went into, took a recess, went into the chambers, went into the bathroom, looked in the mirror and said out loud, stay out of it, it's not your case. I became the, the supervising judge of traffic court and we really shook things up. I noticed that there's so many Spanish-speaking people who are coming to court who don't know why they're there. They don't understand what the ticket says. So a lot of us uh, felt that we had to make the system more open. And one of the bailiffs was Hispanic and he said, yeah, this is terrible. We should have them translated into Spanish. I said, absolutely, let's do it. I think my rule of law school came with it on the Court of Appeal. The first time I really said it, it was to sit down, think through the law and what it means, get to the underpinnings of the reasonings and policy behind the law. The Court of Appeal is a monastic, studious place. And that was a big change for me. And before I was confirmed, I came here to visit the division and to say hello to people. And I was here for a couple of hours. And I didn't hear a telephone ring. It was like, wow, that's, that's different, you know, because I, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I'd have 40 phone messages a day in, at the governor's office, maybe a little more. So that was a change. You're in trial and you have a nanosecond to rule on a really tough evidentiary issue that you've got to rule on because you've got to keep that case going, you know, keep the trial moving. I can spend a week on that same question, just thinking about it if I want on the Court of Appeal. Now you get to the position where you write an opinion and somebody disagrees with you. I mean, a Superior Court judge, you know, I don't care if you disagree with me. Now all of a sudden I have to care. Right. Uh, and it changes your approach and thinking in a way you, you really, I hadn't really thought that through. Concurring and dissenting opinions should be used sparingly. 
And when you use them, have a purpose, have a point. And when there's a dissent, it tells the public and it tells the legislature that there's another way of thinking about this. For the vast majority of cases, these are not going to go to the Supreme Court of California. There's no other relief in sight. This is, this is it, okay? Um, there's no review after this. So folks, we've got to get it right. That's the pressure, is that we've got to get it right. I've always felt that you can't be a good judge if you're always looking over your shoulder at what, uh, the, what people are going to say. You have to make your decision based on the evidence and the law. And if you can't do that, you don't belong on the bench. Judges are by nature inherently reactive. They don't go out and initiate things. Things come to them and they deal with them. That's what you do. But I, th I think judges can sometimes be too timid. My short advice would be bold. That's what I would advise. Uh, don't be afraid to be bold. It's sort of my philosophy about judging. A lot of these cases seem so difficult. And they are. Sometimes I'll look at a case and I'll say, oh my God, what are they talking about? Just ask this simple question. What is this case about? I think it's the same thing that struck me when I became a uh, trial judge. I mean, the, the awesome responsibility that you have as a judge. You are dealing with uh, issues that affect people's lives and the importance of getting it right and working hard. There are principles that, that to be derived from the Constitution, but their application has to be made with a view towards current conditions. And, uh, and, I, and I, think that's, I think that's crucial to, uh, to the role of the judiciary, you know, to make sense out of these laws so that they fit society and ultimately serve the best interest. I've heard a lot of uh, talk about judges having to be totally unbiased, and of course they have to be totally unbiased, but that does not mean that they have to be automatons. Judges are appointed because they're qualified, because someone in power thinks that they are um, good candidates to be part of the um, rule of law. I really loved um, seeing the work that came out of the trial courts. These cases are all about people's lives and what happens to them. And having a role in that is a real privilege. I want people th to think that I tried to do my best at whatever I tried to do, and that in some way um, I left behind a little bit better system than the one I started with um, for people who need the system. It's not all all glory. It's not just being called your honor. It's hard work. The courts are here for the people, not the other way around. I truly love the law. I think, frankly, the judicial system in California is the, you know, one of the finest in not only the nation but the world. I hope you enjoyed this brief selection of the Justice's Oral Histories. Thank you for watching. I encourage you to explore the more than 130 interviews posted on the Legacy Project website.